I'm Ben Wattenberg. President Clinton is about to begin his second term. The Congress is getting back to work. What should he do? What should they do? What should we do? Joining us are four scholars from different points along the political spectrum. David Bowes, vice president of the Cato Institute and author of Libertarianism, a primer. Elliot Abrams, president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and author of Undue Process, the story of how political differences are turned into crimes. Paul Starr, professor of sociology at Princeton University and the editor of The American Prospect, a journal for the liberal imagination. And William Galston, professor at the University of Maryland and a former deputy assistant to President Clinton for domestic policy. The question before this house, what should we do next? This week on Think Tank. President Clinton is about to be re-inaugurated, the first two-term Democratic president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. And Newt Gingrich is the first Republican speaker to be re-elected in 68 years. Now, to get a clue about the next four years, let's begin by going back. In his first State of the Union address in 1993, Bill Clinton laid out his plan for America. Our immediate priority must be to create jobs. Spending must be cut and taxes must be raised. We have to cut the deficit. We will offer a plan to end welfare as we know it. Comprehensive plan for health care reform. The successful completion of a North American free trade agreement. We must pass a tough crime bill. Pass a real campaign finance reform bill this year. Some of these things came about. Some didn't. Many remain on the table. There are arguments about who gets the credit and who gets the blame. So, what should we do next? Luckily for us, there are folks with answers, lots of them. On the right, there are neoconservatives, paleoconservatives, social, religious, and economic conservatives, Main Street, K Street, and Wall Street conservatives, pro-growth, slow-growth, and no-growth conservatives, libertarians, budget balancers, free traders, supply-siders, and country clubbers, let alone compassion conservatives and opportunity conservatives. On the left, we have New Democrats and New Deal Democrats, Jesse Jackson and Scoop Jackson Democrats, labor liberals, progressive liberals, limousine liberals, neoliberals, paleoliberals, Keynesian liberals, and Reagan Democrats, Yellow Dog Democrats, and Blue Dog Democrats. Alas, we can't have one of each on our show, but we do have Four people here who fall somewhere in these lists. Let us begin with you, uh, David Bose. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for, for joining us with all your various ideologies and isms uh, b b behind your experience. Uh, what would you like to see happen uh, within the realm of possibility in the next four years? What, what is your rosiest but realistic scenario? I'd like to see members of Congress read the Constitution, realize that much of what the federal government does is not authorized there, and devote the next four years to making a real start toward um, extricating the federal government from activities that lack constitutional authority. Okay. Elliot Abrams, rosy but realistic. <clears throat> I'd like to see the Congress and the President address some problems that uh, most people would agree we have in the country. Uh, school choice to improve our education system, um, race-blind government instead of affirmative action, which is divisive and unfair, a new look at the American military, which is being built down at a, a very steady pace, um, and a look at Social Security, which is really now beginning. Maybe we could start taking some action. Bill Galston, Rosie, realistic. I agree with Elliot that we ought to focus on the problems before the country and make what progress we can. Here are some important items. Number one, a real long-term balanced budget. Number two, stabilization of important social insurance programs such as Social Security and Medicare. Number three, finally putting our country on the path to real educational excellence. Number four, a pro-family tax code. Uh, 
And I would add two other things. I think we need to give some real attention to campaign finance reform, although God knows what the right approach is, but the American people are demanding it. And I think that the very important international economic initiatives that President Clinton has undertaken in the first term, NAFTA and GATT being Exhibit A and Exhibit B, ought to be strengthened and expanded. Paul Starr, rosy but realistic. Uh, I think it's important uh, that the president uh, fulfill the promises that he made during the campaign. I think it's important for confidence in government. I think it's important for confidence in the Democratic Party. And so, in addition to many of the things that Bill Galson mentioned, I think it's very important that, uh, that education be a high priority. Uh, the president's uh, uh, idea that uh, the first two years of higher education should be made universally accessible is, I, I think, a much more important uh, idea than people have given him credit for. Uh, I think there's progress that can be made on, uh, on expanding uh, health care coverage uh, for the unemployed and for children. Those are two realistic possibilities. This is going to have to take place uh, within the balanced budget. I think that commitment is irrevocable. I'd like to see, however, that the balanced budget uh, be achieved uh, by re-examining some of the defense expenditures that we're now committed to and by looking more carefully at some of the tax loopholes in corporate welfare. Okay, now listen, I, I am going to uh, affix labels to each of you just to make it easier for our viewers. In the course of the conversation, you may deny these labels. Everybody does in Washington, but you are a libertarian. You are a neoconservative. You are a new Democrat, and you are a liberal. Now, you can argue about this later, but that's now. Paul Starr, as a liberal, you're a journalist called the, uh, the liberal imagination. I think that's f fair. Uh, do you say, people are saying, well, liberalism is kind of off the screen now. You've laid out a fairly liberal agenda. Uh, do you think it, it's plausible that we're going to get from here to where you want to go? Well, you say it's off the screen. I think uh, in some other, respects, well, in some respects, I think, I think the election confirmed that the, the public is still very committed to those central pillars of uh, liberalism, uh, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, I think uh, we're going to need to uh, uh, update them. We're going to need to deal with the cost containment problems. Uh, but uh, I, think, uh, I think the commitment is there. I think in some ways uh, uh, our society has become much more liberal, even in the last two decades of Reagan and Bush. Consider some of the social debates of the last few years. Uh, the debate about gay marriage. Now, that would have been off the screen 20 years ago. In fact, the ball has been moved down the field, and a lot of the issues of gay rights now are actually resolved. Is, is that and liberal or, or libertarian? Well, uh, it might be both. Uh, libertarians, after all, used to be uh, called liberals. Mm -hmm. So you, you would both agree on gay marriage? I no, agree that no, I don't actually, but I don't. don't but no, but I. But, but I you, I'm you're, just, you're adopting it as a liberal proposal. In, in no, your no, I'm just saying that in some ways, the country has actually become more liberal. Take take the issue of abortion. Uh, that is now, I think, pretty much resolved in terms of national politics. Uh, and for example, in this campaign, the Republicans made an issue of late-term abortion. Again, they had to pick something on the edge of the issue rather than the core of the issue. So I don't I don't accept the premise. That, uh, that liberalism is going yeah, to the, the original premise was, was, a, it was a question. I'm only asking you, yeah. do you think you can get to where yes. you want to go? And, and your answer is yes. But that's yet. not what makes you a liberal. What makes you a liberal, and this, the true definition of liberalism, you think you can finance everything out of the defense budget, and if the defense budget were $1.10, yeah. you'd still be trying to reduce it to pay for some social program. No, no. First of all, there are a lot of quite responsible people uh, who believe that uh, the defense uh, budget is, uh, is excessive in some respects. Actually, you're sitting next to a libertarian who, uh, <laughs> who I think takes that position also. So this is not even a right-left uh, issue. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, we're spending now far more than all of the other major powers. So, so, uh, so uh, uh, there's... there's well, we, we are, as I said, the sole surviving superpower. You, you, you and, think and, and I want to keep that. You do? Yeah. But, yeah, but I don't without, have any trouble with that. without steel. No, no. That's not, I mean, the, some of the issues have to do with, right. for example, uh, whether we're going to have uh, uh, shared support of our troops abroad that we are, n are, are now paying for. I think that's an issue that, 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 that David Bowes might, might find a lot of uh, uh, support well, if, for. If the defense budget were $1.10, I'd be against cutting it. But at $250 billion, I think there's some room to cut. Yeah, I think we could probably get by with a, a military of a million men uh, instead of a million and a half. 
Um, so I think there's room for cuts how much there. Has it been, However, not how much in has order it been to pay cut? for social programs. Uh-huh. If you so ask as a, as a percentage of um, GDP, gross keeps, domestic product, gross domestic product, it keeps going down to now, uh, you know, heading toward pre-World War II days. Partly because the but GDP Elliot, is growing. But Elliot, as our growing. society gets richer, does that mean we need more military? Well, as we end up being the sole superpower, to take uh, Ben's word, um, we have responsibilities that Belgium does not have. And to say that, well, we're spending more than the other powers, that's not the relevant question. The question is, what do we need for our security and the security of the, let's call it, freedom in the world? I, I think we have focused too much in the last few years, perhaps in the president's first term, um, on domestic issues, and we have been lucky on the international side. There's been no great crisis. We may not be so lucky in the next few years. Maybe it was that President Clinton was skillful. Well, in has, his has handling of something like... Has that thought occurred to you? Uh, the th <laughs> I immediately dismissed it <laughs> I as, as right, ludicrous. Right, right. Um, no, I, we've been lucky in the sense that we've had confrontations in a place like Haiti rather than with the Chinese. Where the President was very skillful was precisely on the question of Taiwan and China. When that looked like it might be heading for a crisis, mm -hmm. and he deserves the credit for that. Mm -hmm. right. Bill Galston, let me ask you this, again, getting back to your label, New Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, in theory, at least, on the presidential level, you and your gang won this election. President Clinton, if he had uh, abandoned the idea of New Democrat in the early years of his presidency, came back to it with a roar in, in this campaign. Many people, I think myself included, think that's why he won. Uh, in, in theory, you and your a uh, band of, of warriors who have been uh, laboring in these DLC, Democratic Leadership Council, uh, vineyards should be all prepared to take over the agenda. Is, is that what's going to happen? Is, is there consensus in the Democratic Party, in the Congress? Is there a coalition? Is, are you where the people are? Number one, in the interests of strict honesty, I must say that I believe that the President won the election for a variety of reasons. I think that what he said on family and cultural issues was very important. But you'd have to be, I think, a fool or an ideologue to deny the force of some very traditional democratic issues like Medicare in moving public opinion and in helping to shape the election. So he won on the basis of a synthesis. That's, that's number one. Number two, I would, do- Would that synthesis go beyond liberal Democrat, new Democrat, and over into some ideas that had been regarded as conservative Republican? Well, it's clear that the president co-opted traditional Republican critiques of Democrats on issues such as crime, welfare, and family values. And that co-opting strategy was, I believe, a very, very important part of the president's victory. Number two, uh, I do not believe, regrettably, that there is a consensus within the Democratic Party on these matters. And I think that there are some go going to be some real strains between the White House on the Congress on, and, and the Congress on some very important issues, such as international economic policy. A phrase that I've heard uh, uh, Bill Galston quoted for, I, I hope it's accurate, uh, uh, as representing uh, 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 at least a part of his position is, is tolerant traditionalism. That's right. And um, I think that's a basis on which, on which uh, many people in the Democratic Party, liberal and, and more moderate, can, can ag agree. I, I, I uh, bet these guys would probably agree. Uh, tolerant that. traditionalism sounds <laughs> fine, but I suspect if we started putting some meat on the bones, <coughs> we might take find the meat some of Take the meat of, uh, of uh, homosexual marriage and take the meat of partial birth abortion, and I think people will start fighting again. Uh, what is, how tolerant does tolerant traditionalism get? Mm -hmm. how, how about uh, affirmative action? Would, 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 your, uh, would your traditionalism uh, include gradually phasing out affirmative action? I've written for many years that I think uh, affirmative action, at least in, in the public sector, is most likely on the way out, that it doesn't have enough support. And I think if you look at the court decisions and what happened in California, that's almost certainly the case. I, th I think, however, one of the interesting things about this last election is that there was much less anger about these issues than in the past. And I think, as some people have said, the, 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 the politics of resentment uh, may be on the decline. And I think that would be a very healthy thing. And that if we could reach some accommodation, it may be that 
corporate concern about diversity remains, and, corporates and corporations, which may in fact have some very legitimate reasons for this, uh, uh, want to uh, make concerted efforts uh, 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 to maintain uh, uh, broad representation uh, in, their, in, their, in their firms. But I think in the public sector it's going to be more and more difficult to sustain this, and I think that era is coming to an end, and that those of us who care about uh, 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 justice, who care about uh, the success of black Americans and other minorities, have to think about other ways because affirmative action isn't going to be it. I think that, I think that affirmative action was the dog that didn't bark in 1996, and it's very important to understand why. Bob Dole did not go after Bill Clinton in a tough and consistent way on affirmative action. Let me, let me make an announcement. Yes. Uh, Bob Dole did not run a smart campaign. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> okay, but, but it was but not, not one of the great uh, all-time campaign strategies. I agree uh, with that. Uh, I agree with that, Ben, but I think it's very important that Newt Gingrich was a restraining force yes, on the Republican was. Party in the matter of affirmative action, and his point was that simply pulling the plug mm -hmm. on it without an affirmative agen opportunity agenda to replace it would be substantively and politically foolish, and I think he was absolutely right about that. Uh, uh, listen, hold on. Let me, let me yes. just get over to this side. Uh, David, I, I asked these, the, our, our liberal and our new <laughs> Democrat, whether they uh, felt a, a chance of accomplishing what they, they, their rosy scenario was. How, how do you feel? Do you think that you, I think there you, is you libertarians can, can make headway? I think so. I think if you look at the initiatives, not the candidates, which are always confused by things like bad, poli uh, bad strategies mm -hmm. and running 73-year-old tired Washington hacks for president, <laughs> um, it's difficult to see what's going on uh, with candidates. That's what I like but about if you look at the initiatives, right, yeah. right. you see that term limits won, tax limits tended to win, um, uh, affirmative action, racial preferences were right. rejected in California, the, the drug laws, drug prohibition was undermined in two states, and an anti-business initiative in California was defeated. I think you see a pretty good libertarian strain running through initiatives when people get to vote on the H issues. How about the, the neoconservative prospects, Elliot? Well, the neoconservative prospects were, <clears throat> I think, not improved in the Democratic Party unless you take very seriously the, uh, the tone of the president's speeches, which I don't. I think they were campaign tactics. I think that there's a real split in the Republican Party, and it is a split between libertarians and, I don't know, let's say traditionalists, on issues um, like censorship. Well, let's uh, say coercive traditionalist, because that, there is a difference there. I'm a traditionalist. You know, I come from a two-parent family. Um, I, I believe in a lot of traditional values. What I don't believe in is, in is using the force of the state to enforce these kinds of rules. That's why I'm against censorship. That's why I'm against um, anti-gay laws. Um, if you're not talking about the state doing these things, then I think traditionalist is an unfair claim. But you have to. I mean, marriage is an official act. When you talk about homosexual marriage, you're talking about state action because all marriage when it, is, when it is registered, when there are rights of inheritance, and so forth, is a state act. Yes, that's right. If the state is going to grant marriage, I believe it should grant it to two loving adults, um, uh, and it is, in, it is in society's interest for people how, how to about, form. How about three? No, I, I, I think you get into a completely different issue. I think that's a canard. Um, two people, what gay people are asking for in this case, is the right to marry someone. Not mm -hmm. the right to marry everyone, not the right to marry anyone, just the right no, to no, marry I mean, someone, reason, I mean, one we, we, person. We, we, and, 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 we, and society benefits from people forming stable relationships. That's why the two-parent family is important. We all agree on that, and that's why even two gay people getting married and settled down would be a good thing. But you first brought up censorship, mm -hmm. and there we clearly are talking about do we have free speech, or does the government use force to tell us what we can see on the internet, what we can see in the movie theater? For that's example, a difference. To protect children, but but here we have it. I mean. I think we're proving the point that there are splits on the right, and the, the, this the, is the this important discussion point, I would think. be a uh, an example of a split between a libertarian economic conservative and a social values conservative. Is that is that what we are saying? Well, I, right I don't claim the word conservative, and I well, think okay, if you believe fine, in free uh, speech uh, right, right. and uh, an, an social an tolerance, economic, an and economic social economic libertarian, you're not a conservative. Right. Do you yeah, think I, I, I don't think we disagree on, on economic right. issues, probably, but we right. do disagree on those social issues. Right. Let me ask a question. We have had in the last, let's say, half a dozen years, to keep it out of one specific presidential uh, term, an enormous amount of change in this country. Uh, welfare, uh, affirmative action, 
Social Security is on the table in terms of investing uh, privately in the stock market. Vast potential changes in the education system that Bill Galson was working on in, in, in the White House, changes in Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, do you think this is a, uh, a ripe and fertile moment that particularly, I mean, we always say, I mean, my high, a, 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 a high school valedictorians always get up and say, you know, well, this is an era of great change. But I really get the feeling that... See, you know, I think both parties have been chastened by the electorate when they went too far uh, and when they pursued the radical change. I, I think if you look at the situation of the country, stand back, you know, uh, America is much better off than the scandals in the newspapers every day might suggest. Uh, we do have uh, peace with the world. We have low unemployment. We have low inflation. We have a declining deficit. Crime is down. I think by and large, and this is quite apart from the question of who deserves the credit for right. this, uh, th things are moving in a much better direction uh, than they were a number of years ago. Well, That's my point, is, is because <laughs> they are, uh, are, are they likely to continue? So are we going to follow these initiatives down the road? Let me just very briefly say I don't agree with that premise. We have peace, prosperity, and moral decline. And that's the issue that social conservatives are trying to address. I mean, when you look at crime rates and divorce rates and, and, and other moral issues, um, it is not so clear that we are better than the bad old days of the 50s. Well, actually, no, no, but it, 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 it is true that we're, I mean, <laughs> better than the bad old days of the mid-80s. Yes, that's probably right. Well, 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 that's well I mean, this happens to well, be now, you know. I mean, that's an important yeah. fact, Elliot. Yeah. Uh, you know, not only is crime down, divorce down, but after a relentless rise, it looks as though the teen pregnancy figures are beginning to head in the right direction. I believe that we have gone through an extended process of what might be called social learning. We experimented for a generation with the removal of all social and cultural restraints on individual behavior. And then in about 1988 or 1989, we recoiled in horror as a society from what our generation had wrought. And we are now looking for a new balance. And I think we're about halfway towards achieving it. And that's good news. So the good news is that the bad news isn't all the news. <laughs> Let me bring up one other item. Uh, into this, so there's almost some common ground here, by the way, gentlemen. The, the, uh, one of the things that might derail this whole express is uh, y you have one, two, three, five, twelve independent counsels, special prosecutors, whatever, about ready, apparently, or possibly to reign on the president's parade. Uh, Elliot, you've been through this, you've written a book about it. What do you have to say about that? I mean, is that... Uh, I would say one thing. That <coughs> and, and you might tell us just very briefly a little bit about your experience. So we I know went where through the, uh, the uh, Lawrence Walsh persecutions in Iran-Contra. Um, one thing that might change Bill Galson's optimistic view is this. You think of Reagan's second term. You have scandal and you have an administration that becomes basically devoted to electing George Bush as president rather than doing anything, if you will, Reaganite. And one, one thing I think one can ask about the second term of Bill Clinton, if it is mired in scandal, is at what point do they, do they basically turn the switch to let's get Al Gore elected president and let's not ever do anything, right though it may be, that could conceivably jeopardize his campaign. Now, if that happens, then Bill Clinton's second term doesn't really accomplish anything except perhaps electing Gore, and perhaps not. Okay, listen, uh, we, we're about out of time. I want to go <coughs> around the room the other way now. And uh, just briefly again, if you had uh, one thing you wanted to happen in these next four years. Uh, resolve the Social Security and Medicare problems uh, in a way that maintains the, uh, the basic commitments that we've made to the ultimate. Educational excellence, national standards, exit exams, charter schools, choice, including non-public choices for low-income kids in our cities. I hate to do this, but I agree with Bill. Uh, school choice and school reform could be the most important single thing. We have had some very interesting coalitions here forming between conservatives, liberals, libertarians. David we've, Rose. We've talked about there being prosperity, <coughs> and there is, but economic growth is at a very low rate compared to the past. I think we could get it up a lot. I think deregulation, tax cuts, and individualized, invested Social Security accounts would be a good way to do that. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, David Bowes, Paul Starr, Elliot Abrams, and Bill Galston. 
and thank you. We depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions or comments to New River Media 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036, or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.